you got the call, I'm, I'm going to condense this yeah. a little bit, but you got the call to go to New York to work for the Associated Press uh, during a time when you and Bud Sickle shared a studio. You were doing commercial artwork. Well, we were both fired, so we had to, uh, to jump into whatever we could uh, do. We, we got some space in an advertising agency, although we were not on their payroll. And I would go out in the morning and sell, and, and Bud would stay back and work on the yesterday's roughs. And uh, I would come back, and the two of us would get out tomorrow's roughs, get them on the bus or Frigidaire. We had some good clients. That Frigidaire ah, that was service. Them. And that was the whole thing. We were going to give them those roughs the next morning, put them on the inner ribbon or the bus, and get them into the art director's office the next morning. And we were doing pretty well. I mean, pretty well. We, we were maybe billing a hundred dollars a week uh, and on a, on our way. We, should, we split 50-50. Now after you went to uh, the Associated Press of New York, uh, a job opened and you wired for him to come and you sort of got him a job, although we know his, his own skills really got him the job. Uh, it was on the Associated Press that he started Scorchy Smith and really revolutionized the way comic strips yeah. were done, didn't it? Can you he talk did. a little bit about that? Well, uh, first of all, the Associated Press feature service in those days always had one illustrator. Uh, I was the illustrator during my period there and, and then went into the Dickie Dare business and the gay 30s. Then uh, George Wonder was the uh, uh, was the next guy. George Wonder was the fellow that took over Terry and the Pirates mm -hmm. after you left. But he was the illustrator. They always had one guy who could draw figures. And, but this uh, was about, what, the 20, 25 years before then, right? Or, no, maybe not that long. Maybe it might have been the, about 15 years The actual before. year that uh, all this took place when I arrived there was 1932. Right, and Wonder took over Terry in 47. Oh, yes, much later. But uh, yeah. uh, he held that same job. I didn't meet him, by the way, during all this time. In fact, he was still uh, wherever he was. He wasn't. He, was, he worked in a bank. <laughs> he oh. was in a brokerage office downtown. Hmm. Anyhow, uh, he was learning to draw all the, all the while. And uh, um, oh, two or three guys whose names you would know held that job at various times. They always had one guy on on the payroll who could draw, period. And when Sickles came along, this uh, their most successful strip was Archie Smith, drawn so abominably that you can't imagine it. Scorchy Smith was kind of a, a Charles Lindbergh and type of hero, wasn't Based he? on Charles Lindbergh, as if Charles Lindbergh had been a freewheeling uh, uh, aviator. You know, a golden, uh, whatever that current new, new thing. Uh, golden monkey? Golden monkey. <laughs> where the yeah. guy had been a, a pilot and he wears the uniform still with the insignia. Right. Off. Well, it was that kind of character if it had been Lindbergh. If Lindbergh had. Was, it, was it drawn very well? Drawn, was hard, it? Horribly drawn. It was not a good story, and it wasn't a good, and it wasn't a good drawing. But somehow it sold. It was their leading strip, and, and John Terry it was the brother of Paul Terry of Terry. Oh, Tune, the animator. And, oh, yes. Uh, he became ill, and uh, they threw sickles into this, and uh, said we we mustn't disturb it because uh, all the clients like it the way it is. So he had to draw this miserable thing, miserable. <laughs> and he did it. He just like an expert forger, you know. So uh, then poor Terry died. I made, I made Terry out a clown, and this it isn't fair. He had tuberculosis, and he died. Oh. So then they said to Sickles, well, just gradually bring it to your own style. And so Sickles did this. It was almost a day-to-day -day transition, and you could see every day he would hype it up a little bit. He put a little bit more, and then finally the kind of hay-like drawings in the background turned to um, exquisite light and shadow stuff, which oh, we're all familiar with. Yes. Well, that's, <coughs> that's the period in Scorchy Smith that everybody yeah. collects and remembers. Yeah. And he was a great, ex <coughs> Sickles was a great experimenter, wasn't he? It's the only fun he had. He didn't even like writing it. He would leave it hanging somewhere and then he'd come back the next day and forget where he was. But he could draw that train or that uh, airplane or whatever over it. But he did, wasn't interested in the, in the writing. And so finally, <coughs> at some point along the line to get him back up on schedule, I wrote uh, several weeks of this stuff. And Frank Amy then lettered it. Bud had been lettering it himself. He was a good letterer, too. 
but it was also a bore. But uh, Frank was doing it very carefully and, and uh, conscientiously, so that Bud had time to play with his toys, you know. Well, I've modeled my current Steve Canyon lettering after the Frank Angley style. I think there's nothing that matches your artwork better than the way Frank Angley approached the alphabet. And somehow it seems, I've even had someone tell me that uh, the lettering looks like it belongs with the picture, that style of lettering. And I give full credit to Frank Angley. He was very proud of that, all the little, little touches and things which aren't noticed by the general reader, of course, but he was proud of the way he put the, the edges around balloons. He had a way of sweeping it, pan around, so that it was several thicknesses. Yes. Just in one sweep and then the other side of the board. And then the tail of the board. He loved to do that. This is his whole big deal. And uh, fortunately, people noticed it. The people in the trade noticed it. Mm -hmm. He was pretty proud of that. The last day that Frank, I was in Dayton when Frank finally had to give up. And uh, I got the, I had sent him the week's wash, you know, Sunday page and six strips. Mm -hmm. And it came to Dayton where we were staying, and uh, just a little note on the front said, "It has come to this." He couldn't uh, hold a pen anymore. Ah, sad. He had a nerve disease of some kind, mm, yes, yeah, and it got to progressively worse. At them. Well, now Bud Sickles, after he left Scorchy Smith, uh, went into illustration. Didn't he work for many of the top magazines as an well, illustrator? He, but before that, he had uh, a good, profitable run doing commercial illustration. The first job he had when he switched over was with Ford Motor Company, oh. the agency for the Ford Motor Company. So that uh, right from the start he had a lot of good samples. Every job he got was just another sample. And he had an agent in those days, by the way, and had a studio on, on Madison Avenue. And uh, uh, he got tired of doing this stuff. This is for old sickles again. Mm. He was making lots of money and so forth. And so one day he just stopped and then started showing his stuff around at the illustration places like Life and Look and um, Reader's Digest, Saturday Evening Post. There were markets in those days. Now by now, World War II was full and sw full, well, it became a lot, going right? full force. And, and didn't, didn't you tell me once that the Army hired him to do special drawings of, of the war? Well, uh, sadly enough, they didn't hire him to do them. Uh, in the beginning, he had a couple of jobs that he did for the War Department for pay. But he came, came the draft, and he would have been a pr private Sickles, which he wanted to be, by the way. Mm -hmm. He wanted to go in as a private and do what Bill Mulden did. Oh. And uh, only a, an enlisted man can do those things, and an officer can't do it. Oh, I so see. when they pulled him out of the draft board, they made him a simulated major. And when he went down to the Pentagon, the civilian closed the whole war. But they just threw these assignments at him, one for the Navy and one for the Army. He actually was a, not a major, he was a uh, lieutenant commander in the Navy. And uh, uh, he just did these things as they came along, those wonderful big news uh, things that he did. Uh, I forgot now what they were called. They were information things that went up in, on the bulletin board in yes. the military. Just yesterday we were talking, uh, you were kind of displeased by the Civil War illustration on the cover of TV Guide. And you were you were telling you reached in your file and brought some of the, in your Noel Sickles file and brought some of Sickles' war drawings out and just pointed out how great he had done the same type of material. Yes. What do you think his skill was in in that kind of drawing? Uh, the research of it in the beginning. He he liked to draw. He said that he, this will give you a, a pretty good insight into it. He said I'm never again going to draw anybody whose pants are pressed. <laughs> he, he liked to draw wrinkles. And, uh, so, of course, the Civil War period, nobody's pants were ever pressed. In fact, mm -hmm. If they were pressed, it meant that you bought them in a store ready-made hmm. instead of having them done by tailor. And uh, so Sickles learned to draw uh, that kind of thing because he enjoyed it, and his father was this sort of guy.